Picking up with Joel and Ellie in Jackson, The Last of Us Part 2 sets out to tell a more expansive story than the first. Opening with a recap, which doubles as an introduction to the guitar, the prologue unsurprisingly goes through a series of restrictive set pieces similar to the opening hours of the previous game. This snowball fight is a nice enough way of tutorialising players before any combat encounters take place. By itself, it could hardly be said to harm the pace in any significant way, but it shows that we're not expected to hold a certain level of knowledge or competence from having played the previous one. While this is a common assumption to make, it seems especially egregious in The Last of Us Part 2, when its story pulls so heavily from Part 1 that it would be unwise to use the sequel as a starting point. It's not that this little warm-up session itself is a problem, just that we'll once again be taking things slow in the beginning, rather than being thrown into more engaging situations since Ellie and the player should already know how to handle themselves by this point. At the risk of spoiling my own review, I can't help but think that the opening hours represent one of my problems with the game in miniature. After a series of slow set pieces as Joel and Ellie, we then suffer a hard reset to Abby's perspective which comes with another restrictive narrative sequence. Swapping back to Ellie then necessitates yet more downtime to rebuild tension from her perspective and so on. All told, it's about an hour before anything resembling core gameplay, and while it's true that the original suffered from a similarly slow start, at least it settled into a comfortable rhythm after about two hours. The most comparable stretch of this instalment would be Ellie's first two days in Seattle, and while I still think the challenge rises too slowly for a sequel, it does at least fall into that same comfortable groove of combat and scavenging interspersed with occasional set pieces. Placing the downtown map at the beginning was a wise decision, both because players will be able to rush through it more quickly on subsequent playthroughs, thereby ramping up a little faster, and because such a large map might seem tedious if it arrived somewhere in the middle. It gives Ellie and Dina's relationship time to breathe. But I'll be and is pleasantly reminiscent of the first game, despite its open ended structure. Exploration is now occasionally facilitated by these technically impressive ropes, but unfortunately, they're seldom put to clever use. This optional room, which requires a glass overhang to be smashed so a rope can be swung around a pole, is an impressive exception which shows some latent puzzle solving potential. This is a more delicate issue than simply saying that complicated uses would automatically be better. After all, it's not as though a tense sewer chase would be improved by stumping the player with a tricky rope throw. There's a time and a place for everything, but the ample quiet moments certainly provide time to give these ropes a better workout. On the plus side, the rare occasions where you have to push a cart around now sometimes require a little bit of thought rather than just moving an object from point A to point B. Safes now operate differently as well, with the player required to enter the code manually, leading to a few small puzzle solving opportunities. None of these moments are exactly brain teasers, but most of the time they're straight up more engaging than the simplistic ladder or plank shuffling from the previous game, which is obviously a win. As for combat, friendly AI has been improved to more consistently avoid enemy line of sight. It's not foolproof, but it's gotten to the point where it never happened to me on my first playthrough, so it seems fair enough that allies can actually break stealth now as a last resort if they're seen. Having an ally's actions punish the player so severely could be a fatal problem if we were talking about a different game, but this is what I would call an experiential title, by which I mean the moment to moment feeling of playing is more important than getting the perfect encounter or seeing how far the mechanics can be pushed through skillful play. As such, prioritising its immersive quality over raw mechanics makes sense, as long as it still strikes a reasonable balance between them, which I'd say holds true here considering I've struggled to even get footage of an ally being discovered. For the same reason, I'll retract my complaint about enemies turning around mid-patrol. A little unpredictability can be good, and I'm glad they've kept it for the sequel. Likewise, since this is an experiential title, I don't think it benefits from bumping the difficulty up to a point where you repeatedly fail each encounter, but thanks to the inclusion of modular difficulty settings, it's possible to make stealth more challenging without increasing the inevitable damage of a firefight. This mixture worked out well enough for me personally, but the point is each player should be able to find a configuration which gives them a good experience. In terms of additions, the biggest one is grass, which acts as cover when crouched or prone. This increases the amount of coverage and pathways for a stealth approach while still feeling relatively grounded and rewarding to exploit. The pistol silencer shines here but remains reasonably balanced thanks to its low durability. 
Ellie's chapters do suffer slightly from reduced resource management compared to Joel or Abby since shivs are no longer required for clicker kills, but for the most part combat is quite similar to the previous game. If I had a major criticism of the new stuff, it would be that grass and water make it too easy to regain stealth after a botched ambush. Even with that difficulty slider cranked all the way up, enemies will quickly lose sight of Ellie in grass, which makes the punishment for being seen not much of a punishment at all. Perhaps any inconsistency would lead to frustration, but it seems natural that enemies would have sharpened vision when they're on high alert, which could make an escape more challenging to achieve. Anyway, while it would be easy to dismiss The Last of Us as just another third-person shooter, the balance they struck here with many actions incurring a nerve-wracking time penalty is still satisfying and appropriate for the setting. More importantly, I think it's a series which exemplifies how presentation itself can enhance gameplay with the sheer brutality of attack animations dramatically increasing the tension. This one might be somewhat more gory than its predecessor, but still avoids slipping into gratuitousness. The cut to black during a death avoids having to model some nasty stuff while still capitalising on a player's imagination to fill in those gruesome gaps. Crucially, not all of these animations are created to be equally disturbing, which allows some to be even more shocking for added impact at certain times. Furthering this horror, enemies will call out for their dead friends by name, choke on their own blood and plead for their life. Overall, this grounded presentation imparts a sense of trepidation which will probably cause you to slow down and consider each encounter more carefully than you would otherwise. While it's possible to deconstruct a game into just its mechanics after the fact, it's impossible to experience it that way while you're playing. The tense presentation seemed like it was always affecting my decision making, turning every encounter into a stress test about staying calm under pressure. For me, this aspect peaked with the first Seraphite encounter, which has remained the general highlight as far as I'm concerned. It's a nice example of how a grounded setting doesn't have to work against gameplay, because whistling is something which makes sense for guerrilla warfare while also being enjoyable to fight against. I instinctively felt I'd be able to understand what each whistle meant with some more playtime, and thankfully that prediction turned out to be correct. Mechanically, these opponents are almost identical to the WLF and their tactics, but the simple change to obscuring their callouts adds a little extra challenge through clever sound design alone. There's no point dwelling on every little change to the core gameplay, but it's worth saying that most, if not all, seem to be for the better. Dogs are a great new enemy type, and stalkers have been revised so they're still difficult but seem somewhat more consistent than before. I'm not sure I gave the first game due praise for what an effective combination runners and clickers are in tandem. One tells you not to make noise in a certain area, and the other tells you not to be seen in a certain area. Combined, these create overlapping vision and hearing zones the player needs to factor in as they move around. While some more infected variety would have been welcome, it wasn't broke and thus hasn't been fixed. What stings more are the moments of missed potential, in particular the torch-carrying Seraphites which can disappear one by one without alerting their companions. It also could have been interesting to see Lev utilise the Seraphites' whistles against them somehow. Similarly, the Rattlers ramp up difficulty appropriately for the finale, but it's a shame these helmets don't show up in some earlier encounters. Individually, most of the alterations or additions are minor, but on the whole it's fair to say that the gameplay has improved substantially from the first, with one exception that resource balancing isn't quite as tight, especially for Ellie. Speaking of tight, it's surprising how well the increased mobility works and is communicated by the visuals. It seems as though it would have been an ordeal to craft such organic environments without confusing the player about where they can or can't fit. There's a lot of freedom here, although it does sometimes feel like a trick rather than a true expansion of level design. Sliding under objects while prone obviously opens up new possibilities, but these cracks and walls would be almost functionally identical if they were wide enough to walk through normally. At least it allows the stage to look less boxy and more natural. It really should go without saying, but the environments are superb. Each level does a good job of guiding players without feeling forceful, there's an increase in verticality which complicates stealth, and the visuals are not only high fidelity, but also composed nicely to result in a lot of beautiful scenery. Not content with just being taller, most major encounters take place in even wider arenas than before, which improves combat but also increases the amount of time spent scavenging afterwards. The funny thing is, these areas rarely have many resources, but in a post-apocalyptic setting it's only natural to want to eke out every advantage possible by scouring thoroughly. 
I'm not sure there's any good mechanical way of disincentivizing players from wasting their time like this, since even if there was nothing to find, there would be no way of knowing that without exploring it all anyway. My point is, there needed to be something else to prop up these moments, like an increased amount of banter between characters. Much of their development unfolds outside of cutscenes, but those moments usually take place outside of combat arenas as well, which means you'll spend a lot of time looking for resources in silence. My point here isn't just that these moments waste time. The real issue is that they reveal some of the game's artificiality. No matter how urgently the story might be pushing you forward, hanging around for resources never backfires. Tension evaporates as soon as the last enemy is dead, usually accompanied by a helpful piece of dialogue indicating the fight is over. To be fair, they pull a couple of neat tricks early to blur these lines. A patrol at the gas station seems timed specifically to interrupt you while you'll likely be on the workbench. To the game's credit, it doesn't even wait for you to start working there before it spawns them, it just sets them up ahead of time so this scenario is likely to happen without forcing the matter. In other words, it's organic. Later, this lack of safety is reinforced by a more scripted ambush at a different bench. These moments are great, particularly the first one, but it quickly becomes clear they're the exception rather than the rule. Let me put it this way. Some bad shit goes down in a school, then you escape across the street right as a search party arrives. At this point, the characters need to keep a low profile, but I don't. It doesn't matter if I shoot my gun or shine my flashlight at them, they might as well have slipped into another dimension. In fact, as far as programming goes, that's probably not a bad analogy. Unless you're already in a combat encounter, there's never any reason to stay crouched, turn the flashlight off, or resist firing the gun. When Ellie says, Keep an eye on those windows. I don't need to pay attention because an ambush will either happen or it won't. My actions make no difference. Now I realize this is one of those complaints which will sound insane to some of you, so let me linger here for a second. Yes, I've played a computer game before. I know that enemies in the school can't hear me because they were just scripted to run inside. Yes, I also know that it would be impractical to craft alternate outcomes for a bunch of these scenarios. In this case, you'd need custom AI, which is aware of the fact that Ellie and Dina are unreachable from the street. I get why it works the way it does, and I understand why you might have difficulty envisioning it any differently, but the game itself provides some examples of what that might look like. This is why Ellie's first day in Seattle is one of my favourite sections, because there are a couple of moments where you can turn a corner and see someone who wasn't there a minute ago. Imagine this just on a larger scale, where firing a gun could result in a reinforcement patrol arriving from elsewhere. Now, I feel hesitant about making this complaint because it's a bit like asking for a different game altogether, but I'd be lying if I said it wasn't frequently on my mind while playing. To be clear, I always acted as was expected of me on my first playthrough, but the gap between presentation and mechanics became obvious regardless. One key factor here is just how often the gameplay shifts into some kind of scripted event. After those first two days, you're rarely given enough uninterrupted time for a patrol to even be possible. There are eight major narrative sequences which mostly consist of walking around to look at things, and this is on top of myriad smaller moments which can each last minutes, like Ellie's Seattle intro or arriving at the hospital as Abby. Some breaks from the norm are welcome. This is a hard thing to quantify, but I would say Ellie gets the better combat arenas, especially if we factor in Santa Barbara, whereas Abby gets the better set pieces. The sniper battle against Tommy, the hospital boss fight, and the destruction of Haven are particular highlights. Tommy's fight avoids the old invisible sniper problem by simply disallowing the player from getting their sight over him, and the moment where he lures infected towards Abby is a fantastic case of using the player's own tactics against them. The hospital monstrosity expands on the infected in an interesting way, while excusing how it could be such a bullet sponge. It's a little too easy to just burst this thing down, but it's revolting, unexpected, and works as a nice traditional boss fight. Haven's destruction is a horrific waste of life, and the choreography here conveys the senselessness of this violence extremely well. Outside of those highlights, it seems fair that each protagonist would get a relaxed introduction at their home base, and obviously the birthday museum trip presents a charming vision of our protagonists after the events of the first game. As a cinematic title, such sequences should be expected, but even so, some feel like a complete waste of time. Of course, I'm mainly talking about moments like visiting the fob, where you're just expected to gawk at things, but I also feel the need to point out that this Seraphite ambush actually requires no inputs to survive. You can at least fall off the crane as Abby, or fail to mash hard enough with Ellie, but the veneer of interactivity is pretty thin at times. This is basically pseudoscience, but I have a theory which explains differing reactions to these kinds of moments. 
Maybe you've heard the analogy that extroverts expend energy when alone, whereas introverts expend energy in the company of other people. Something similar is true for games. I'm a mechanical extrovert. I recover energy when I have full access to my moveset and I'm placed in a scenario where I'm expected to make use of that. Conversely, I expend energy when freedom is taken away because to me, this comes with a feeling of being constrained along with a desire to break free from those confines. Presumably, some people are the opposite. They would expend energy in a combat scenario when there are many split-second decisions to make, then they would recuperate when put into a situation which has no failure state. As you might imagine, it's probably not that straightforward in practice, with different players having different tolerance levels or degrees of preference, and it's not as though there can't be any difference in quality between quiet moments either. For what it's worth, I think exploring Joel's house after his death was the best of these sections, and not just because it's short. Going through Joel's possessions allows the player to participate in Ellie's grieving process in an effective and believable way. For the most part, mechanical introverts would have a much better time with this game because these narrative sequences would be a welcome reprieve and the combat would be even more tense. This is my attempt to understand, but not to excuse. As far as I'm concerned, Naughty Dog's games have become increasingly bloated with The Last of Us Part II just quadrupling down on this style of pacing. Even disregarding the quality of each individual interruption, the sheer number of them robs the world of its ability to speak for itself. There's a type of emergent storytelling which can unfold when a player is left to their own devices, like getting caught out by a patrol or stumbling into an encounter where they didn't expect one. Rather than foster those kinds of moments, we're constantly swept into much more tightly scripted scenarios which now also involve swapping protagonists and leaping through time. So let's do our own little flashback to the beginning and finally discuss the story itself. I'm willing to give the prologue a pass on Joel's death being a little out of character. It's important to note that Tommy says Joel's name first, at which point lying is no longer an option, and although it's convenient for Joel to be the very first person Abby runs into, stranger things have happened. Joel's relaxation around the other group is difficult to believe since Ellie lives in Jackson, which he obviously wants to protect at all costs. However, it is worth noting that he must have been in a great mood that morning given what happened the night before. If you imagine this as the reason he let his guard down, then it's more believable and all the more tragic. Anyway, I'm willing to overlook some clumsiness here considering his death is the impetus for the entire plot. Also, while it is hard to watch a likeable character get tortured and spit on, I applaud the decision not to have Joel go down in a pandering blaze of glory. Of course, there's other less dramatic ways he could reasonably have died, but it makes sense that Joel shouldn't be exempt from a bleak death just because he happened to be the protagonist of the first game. By the time the credits rolled, there was no question in my mind that the writers paid plenty of respect to this character. That said, Joel's death does become harder to swallow as more and more contrivances pile up. I've only been living in the apocalypse for a few months and even I know it's moronic to leave your hideout lights on or not secure an easily opened window. Both of these things set me on edge once Ellie arrived at the theatre and both came back to bite her later even though I could do nothing about it as a player. Mel inexplicably arrives at the aquarium which nearly killed Ellie and Abby to reach. Abby's dad just happens to rescue a zebra on the same day Ellie arrives there in what is by far the most ham-fisted display of benevolence ever seen in this franchise. Dina draws a giant circle around their hideout for no reason, then Ellie drops it for Abby to find. The list goes on. Pause if you give a shit what that list looks like. I'm not going to dwell on every questionable plot point, and I'm not going to pretend I know exactly how Naughty Dog went about crafting this narrative, but it feels plot driven, where certain events were given priority and characters were maneuvered to cause those events even if believability had to be stretched to breaking point. This seems like a mistake because the first game didn't excel thanks to its plot, it excelled thanks to its characters. To be fair, I think this reveals how difficult it must have been to craft a follow up without just doing the same thing again. Since the goal of delivering Ellie to the Fireflies was irrelevant for much of the first game, then any sequel about two characters moving from point A to point B would feel like a retread, no matter what reason they had motivating their journey. It couldn't just be another bonding exercise between two people, it had to be something else, hence the more complicated narrative this time around. Just so we're all on the same page, I'll give you my reading of the story, at least Ellie's side of it since she's the most complex character. Obviously, she remained suspicious after the encounter with the Fireflies and eventually had those suspicions confirmed. 
The way I see it, this gives her two reasons to be angry at Joel. The first is just that he lied to her for years, but the second is hard to pinpoint in any particular cutscene. Instead, I think it bubbles under the surface, because Ellie is bad at expressing herself and doesn't want to talk to Joel about it, but can't open up to anyone else since it has to stay a secret. She doesn't hate him for saving her, but knowing what happened placed a psychological burden on her. Set aside the Firefly's apparent incompetence for now, or even the viability of a vaccine at all when a clicker can still tear your face off. Just imagine the kind of best case dream scenario that might be running through Ellie's mind and you can easily imagine that leading to an immense amount of survivor guilt. This is the main reason she's angry at Joel, the burden this knowledge has placed on her, and maybe some of it is a little selfish, not unlike Joel's actions in the first game. She probably just wishes she could live a normal life, and almost had the opportunity to do so, but couldn't bring herself to accept Joel's lie. Ultimately, she wants to forgive Joel because he saved her life, but her guilt probably tells her that she shouldn't be allowed to feel positively towards him given the potential cost of his actions. When the game begins, she's finally ready to start moving past that before Joel dies. This gives her another reason to feel guilty, being unsure if Joel knew how much he meant to her before he died. She had effectively bottled up years of love for Joel before the events of the game, and now that unexpressed love can never reach him anymore, so she turns to what she sees as the next best outlet for that emotion, avenging his death. When you view the story this way, all the fucked up stuff Ellie does is an expression of her love for Joel. This is the core theme as I see it, love being distorted and causing some messed up things. It's worth noting that both Abby and the cult are twisted in similar ways. You might think I'm reading too much into it, but I think this is hinted at by the hesitation you can feel in Ellie's anger towards Joel. Note that she decides she wants to mend their relationship right after he says he has no regrets about saving her. Also, at some point she discards all her backpack pins except the one Joel gave her, a sign that she still cares about him regardless of whatever's happening to their relationship on a surface level. This is a great foundation for the story, and I think the way the game is able to convey these emotions while leaving so much unsaid is unparalleled across the entire medium. Naughty Dog's facial capture and animation raised the bar yet again, leading to all kinds of subtle emotions being readable in a way most studios can't even dream of matching right now. I have no doubt this will look worse with time since it targets realism and future games will be able to deliver on that promise much better, but it's cutting edge and serves the story well. This is a strong foundation, but the way the narrative unfolds from here really doesn't do this premise justice. Before I get into that, I'd like to point out a few more positives and continue expanding on my interpretation. One of the more well-realized aspects is a kind of environmental symbolism which pops up from time to time. Most notably, it seems to relate Joel to various animals. There's this museum display, which obviously foreshadows his death, surrounded by wolves, this owl mug which is given prominence at two crucial moments, and this story of a toy horse made real by the love of a child. At first I found it confusing that Joel would be equated with multiple animals instead of just one. Perhaps the developers were being scattershot with their symbolism, hoping that players would read extra meaning into it as a result. I'm not ruling that out, but it may have been more calculated since Joel's house is conspicuously filled with carvings of animals as well. Now, this is all up to interpretation, but I think this conveys the idea of Joel as a force of nature, both in the effect he had on the world and in terms of morality. Most of us agree that animals can't be held to the same moral framework as humans, and perhaps this shows how Joel's animalistic decision to protect his young no matter the cost also can't be judged from the comfort of hindsight. It's even hinted that Abby's father would have done the same thing had he been put in that position. Personally, I've always had a theory that the eponymous Last of Us doesn't refer to the grubby factions fighting for scraps. It refers to Joel specifically because he kept his humanity by prioritizing the safety of a loved one above all else. You might say there's no point in humanity's survival if we keep sinking to new lows rather than valuing the lives we're given. Anyway, there's a few other symbolic aspects which can be cause for reflection if they catch you the right way. Bigot sandwiches notwithstanding, individual lines of dialogue are also pretty well written, with Joel and Ellie's difficulty opening up to each other being handled particularly well. Overall, the writing succeeds on a micro level, but flounders on a macro level because apart from Abby and Lev, none of the new characters are compelling and there are major story beats which fall flat. The narrative hinges on its ending, but Ellie's decision to spare Abby simply isn't believable. Don't get me wrong, the last stretch leading up to the final confrontation is great. 
Placing a woman with a braid right next to Abby so Abby's dishevelled appearance would be even more shocking was a brilliant touch. Again, we find some nice details in isolation, but the big picture doesn't make much sense. Bear in mind, I'm not saying I wanted to kill Abby. Some of these empathy building exercises with her felt extremely forced on my first playthrough, and I still think the zebra one is so ham-fisted it actually works against Abby because it reveals the hand of the writer conspiring in her favour. That said, I've grown to understand some of the others, like playing fetch with Alice. This also seemed contrived on my first playthrough, obviously contrasting her behaviour against Ellie who has to kill that same dog to survive. However, on my second playthrough I was reminded that I had actually pet a dog as Ellie in the beginning. A moment which seemed so natural as Ellie, I had completely forgotten about it, had rubbed me the wrong way as Abby, which seems unfair on my behalf. Abby's crew range from completely unlikable dickhead to just plain boring, but the banter between her and Lev can be charming. What's going on between you and your friend Owen? Oh my god, Lev, now? Over time, it's hinted that Abby feels guilt-ridden about what she did to Joel, with Lev being used as a path to redemption. I never grew fond of Abby, but at least her and Lev are the highlights of her campaign. After playing her for 10 hours, it's hard not to feel some sympathy, and on an intellectual level, it's understandable why she might want to kill Joel, even if his torture is much harder to justify. Regardless, as far as I'm concerned, all of Abby's development was rendered pointless as soon as the boss fight against Ellie started, and while I have no doubt discussion about the ending will continue for some time, if you ask me, this is the most contentious decision they made. While I can't help but respect a developer whenever they take a risk, I have to be honest and say it didn't work for me on any level whatsoever. The first time Ellie did this, I laughed. Not in a callous way, mind you, but because some kind of absurdity crashed down on me at this point. Just hours earlier, redecorating Abby's face was the goal, but now it was a failure state. Flipping the script made it abundantly clear how little agency I had as a player, so all of a sudden the game felt like two puppets I was barely in control of, acting out a film I had no impact on. I would have been perfectly content to just set the controller down at this point and let them tell the story they had to tell because I lost any interest in pretending to pull the strings. If you're a fan of real-time strategy games, then you're probably no stranger to working against the side you were just rooting for. Functionally, it's not innovative to fight a character you once controlled, but whatever it is about the execution of this in The Last of Us Part 2 felt unique to me. It might just be the more intimate perspective, gritty setting, or emphasis on individual characters, but I can genuinely say this boss fight caused a feeling I've never experienced elsewhere, which is something worth discussing, even if I have a hard time seeing any redeeming qualities in it. Maybe I'm just not empathetic enough. Maybe this will mark the beginning of a new storytelling epoch in games where it'll be normal to flip between antagonistic perspectives. Maybe we all just need to adjust to this idea and someday people will look back on reviews like this one wondering what the big deal was. I wouldn't rule it out, but I'm sceptical because it feels like a rejection of the strengths and denial of the weaknesses inherent to the medium. What I mean is, making my character pet a dog can be an endearing experience, so it stands to reason that the mere act of controlling a character can cause a player to form a connection with them. On some level, this bond happens whether you want it to or not. Abby's entire half seems to rely on that phenomenon. This is why I find the abundance of flashbacks so misguided, because they require constant readjustment to account for your avatar's perspective at that time. One minute we're avenging Joel, the next he's giving us a birthday present and we're expected to roam about this museum as though we didn't already see him get his head caved in. If you were to approach this sequence with the knowledge you actually have as a player, the only thing you would try to do is hug Joel, but instead you have to play dumb and play along. This is the difference between merely being an actor and being a participant. To be fair, this actor-participant criticism isn't as devastating as it might first sound. If we take the most strict approach to this distinction, then any story-driven game can only be acted out after that first playthrough, since the player will already know what happens. Even so, I think there's something to be said for presenting a game chronologically, more so than with books or films. At least that way, you take a single mental leap at the start to ignore your foreknowledge and then can settle into your role along the way. Cutting back and forth makes this almost impossible, which contributes to that feeling of acting out a script versus taking part like a genuine participant. In a sense, it's as though you're being controlled by the game rather than vice versa. 
Despite all of this, the main reason the ending didn't work for me is much more simple. Ellie hasn't seen Abby's side of the story. In order to understand Ellie's perspective, we need to forget all of the Abby chapters, so regardless of how you might feel about Abby by the end, to Ellie she's still Joel's killer first and foremost. Letting Abby go at the last moment, especially after just getting two of her fingers bitten off, strikes me as dishonest. Not to mention, she had killed over a hundred people just to get to this moment, which is one hell of a sunk cost. Granted, that number can go a lot lower if you're willing to stealth your way through as many encounters as possible, but that doesn't seem true to character either. What's strange is that every one of Ellie's kills against Abby's crew seems engineered to introduce an increased amount of moral ambiguity. This one is clearly self-defense. This one is arguably Ellie's darkest moment, but Nora is about to die from spore inhalation anyway and Ellie offers her a mercy kill if she cooperates. These ones are also self-defense with Ellie not even knowing that Mel is pregnant. It's as though they were written without any regard for the fact that Ellie would be killing a hundred people on the way there. I don't want to bang on the ludo-narrative dissonance drum too hard, but this is a disappointment coming on the heels of the first game which only suffered from this problem in more superficial ways. Yes, it was bad that the AI partners would bumble around, but it's easier to forgive an issue when you know it's not integral to the experience. You could imagine a more polished version of the same game which would avoid that problem. The most important thing is Joel's portrayal as a pragmatic killer is honoured all the way through. You're not expected to forget about the NPCs you murdered along the way, it's accepted as part of the mission to deliver Ellie unscathed. By the time you get to the ending, where things are more morally ambiguous, it's perfectly understandable why Joel would make his choice. By contrast, maybe this woman was pregnant. Maybe this guy was one day away from executing some master plan to free all the slaves. If this random NPC can turn out to have a backstory, then it stands to reason that all those people Ellie killed have stories of their own. I thought this was the point of giving them names and blood-curdling screams. By sparing Abby, it seems as though Ellie has retained her humanity and become The Last of Us 2, but you'd have to ignore all those other kills to think so. At this point, what's one more? Seriously, it sounds juvenile, but if you have difficulty seeing the ludonarrative dissonance here, I think you're underestimating the amount of determination it would take to infiltrate enemy territory and indiscriminately murder everyone standing between you and revenge. I'm not even naive enough to think Ellie has forgiven Abby by the end. I reckon she probably still hates her guts, but regardless of whatever epiphany she might have in the moment, I just don't think she'd stop after killing so many people and getting her fingers bitten off. This is like spending two years of your life and losing your family in a mad quest to pop the world's largest sheet of bubble wrap only to drop it on the ground right before doing the last one. The futility of it all might very well become clear as you make your way towards the end, but faced with such a long sought after goal, it would be almost impossible to back down. We don't have to do this. You know that, right? <sighs> What's the other option? Go back to Tommy's. Be done with this whole damn thing. After all we've been through. Everything that I've done. It can't be for nothing. Go. Just take him. Your reaction to the juxtaposition of those two clips probably depends on how you feel about part two as a sequel. If you think I just took a nine iron to Naughty Dog by using their own writing against them, then you should second guess yourself. After all, they remember Joel misses coffee and likes to play guitar on his porch, so it seems unlikely they'd just forget Ellie said something so heavy at such a critical moment. It's far more likely that part two is intended to contrast against part one, but inverting a character's behaviour isn't necessarily clever or deep either. The charitable reading is that Ellie has become more like her father figure by gaining a willingness to turn back at the last moment, but this ignores the fact that Joel was never invested in getting Ellie to the Fireflies anyway. Ellie is the motivated party in both games and as such her change of heart in the second becomes even harder to believe. Regardless of whether Ellie's decision makes sense, I think the anti-climax robs the story of what could have been a better ending. If Ellie had killed Abby, she still would have lost everything, and we'd be left with the question of whether it was worthwhile. Abby would complete her role as a tragic character, garnering some more sympathy after the fact, and there could be a debate about whether Ellie went too far, mirroring the ending of the first.
there would be a question, or at least something to think about. Now if we ask ourselves whether it was worthwhile, the answer is clearly no. Ellie lost everything and gained nothing except maybe a cure for her PTSD. In spite of all the nihilistic shit that goes down along the way, there's a nice message here about how helping people leads to happiness in a way that revenge doesn't. Even if you don't believe the world works this way, it's good to see stories that encourage us to transcend the emotions which sometimes hold us back. I'm not saying it was misguided to use this theme, just that it shouldn't have to come at the cost of characterization. Likewise, Ellie leaving Joel's guitar behind rings equally hollow. It smacks of a desire to end the narrative on a profound image, while ignoring that this just isn't how people behave. Even if my entire reading of the story is wrong and Ellie actually hates Joel, it's still hard to imagine she would leave an heirloom to rot like this. There's a million alternate endings you could propose, so I don't expect my suggestions to change any minds. All I know is, whatever intellectual way I might try to rationalise the ending, nothing will change the fact that it didn't feel right in the moment. It's as though the story does everything it can to justify Abby's behaviour, then fails to honour Ellie's anger once it returns to her perspective. Stories aren't bad just because the protagonist gets fucked over. I would even say The Last of Us Part 2 ends on a relatively hopeful note anyway, with the implication being that Ellie has nowhere to go but up. Still, considering how well the first game ended, I think there needed to be a stronger justification for revisiting this character. After all, it's not just that the sequel left me nothing to think about, but also that the ambiguity of the first ending is gone now too. Unlike last time, I'm not apprehensive about how they might continue with Ellie, but I'm not invested either. It's hard not to respect The Last of Us Part 2. They could have turned in a generic sequel about Joel and Ellie on some revenge trip, thereby coasting on praise for two beloved characters. Spending so much time with Abby instead was risky, but a risk is called a risk for a reason. I'm not prepared to say that Abby's story could never work, just that this iteration of it didn't connect with me at least. Even ignoring the ending, there are too many plodding moments and pacing mishaps along the way. Outside of that, it's hard to quibble with the phenomenal presentation. It's a beautiful world, well realised by superb animation, environments and technical prowess. While I wish I could have spent more time surviving of my own volition, there were some real highlights from time to time. That first Seraphite ambush has already firmly lodged itself into my memory, right next to Ellie's deer hunt. The unflinching portrayal of violence also deserves commendation. For better or worse, you never get the impression that Naughty Dog were pulling their punches, often literally. The tense mixture of stealth and combat benefits greatly from that gritty setting, but in another sense the game does sometimes feel like less than the sum of its parts. It all too often interrupts itself to tell a tale I'm not convinced needed to be told. At worst, Abby's story seems ill-suited to an interactive medium entirely, but even though I never grew fond of her as a character, at least her introduction was a bold move carried out with conviction, and that's a very easy thing for me to forgive. <laughs>